So the first thing I want to talk about is PE ratios, and this is sort of a pet peeve of mine. Um, I think it's one of the first things that young investors learn, and many people don't grow out of it. And even professional investors talk about PE ratios way too much. And uh, PE ratios are basically useless. And any anytime you hear someone talking about PE ratios, you should just sort of nod your head and smile and kind of assume that anything this person's saying is is likely to be not too valuable. Um, PE ratios are a a quotient. Basically, it's price divided by earnings. And this can be useful if you have, um, it's sort of a useful concept. And you can, instead of a PE ratio, you could think of it as a payback period, right? Like in a bond, if you've lent out $20 million and you're getting a million dollars back every year, it's 20 years until you get paid back. And that makes sense. Um, if you think about um, a company, let's say you had a company that's been in your family for a long time, and the company um, makes a million dollars a year in, in, in net income and you get an offer to buy the company, someone wants to buy the company for $20 million, you'd say, okay, well, it'll take me 20 years more or less to get back um, to get back that money. And that's, that's a better term for it is actually payback period. Of course, the problem is that, that the, the net income will fluctuate quite a bit. And anyone who advocates for PE would say, well, that makes sense if you have something that's going from 1 to 1.1 to 1.2, the PE ratio should be 30 times earnings because it's growing. And that's that's just totally silly. Um, it's it's a really remarkably um, inaccurate way to do it. So one of the reasons is that the E in the PE uh, will change quite a bit. And it's hard to use a PE on something that's not is what I call steady state income and steady state cash flow. And the concept that multiples expand or contract is a complete idiocy and fallacy. Uh, multiples don't expand or contract. Discount rates can contract. Discount rates can expand, leading to changes in the price. But it's sort of like thinking like the dog is wagging the tail, that there is some PE ratio that people use and, and that that's how it works. So, of course, PE ratios become very much, it shows their, their worthlessness when, when you think about companies that are subscale or super scale and cash flow negative, you really start to realize that looking and thinking about PE ratios is more or less um, nonsense. So um, sometimes they can be useful for very, very large cap companies where scale is unlikely to change and earnings are unlikely to change. And then the shorthand of it being a payback period makes a lot more sense. If Procter & Gamble is 18 times earnings, then you could say, well, that's a 7% uh, or more like a 6%, right? 6.2% uh, dividend yield or earnings yield. And you can compare that to other yields you can get in the markets. And, and an inverse PE is the way to think about that. So there's some, some reasons where you can get that, but the PE doesn't encompass anything like maturity or you can have different discount rates for different periods of investment. We'll talk about that in a second. You could have a small discount rate for the next few years, a large discount rate for, for the out years. Uh, it doesn't account for terminal growth. It doesn't account for any of those things. So PE ratio is basically worthless. A high PE ratio doesn't mean something's overvalued or undervalued. Uh, it, is, is, it means virtually nothing. So try to avoid anyone that says anything about PE ratios, try to avoid looking at them. Just think about area under the curve cash flows, cumulative cash flows, integral of cash flows. That's a net present value. That's how real investors invest. Um, so just focus on that. Um, we're about to get into Groupon. And one of the things I wanted to mention is that uh, the company sold a convertible bond. And I thought that um, it would make sense to talk about what a convertible bond is. And uh, at some point I'll do a debt lesson uh, but a convertible bond is a bond, it, but it's very different. It's a very different kind of bond. It's actually uh, very equity-like in that in in that it can convert into equity, and this may confuse you. And and the the best way to think about it is um, think about it like normal debt. In normal debt, you borrow money for some coupon, say five percent, and you can't convert your your debt into equity. Right, you're just going to get your five percent. The company can go up by it could be the next Amazon.com or the next Google. It could go up by uh, fifty fold, but you still can't get um, you can't get uh, any upside other than your five percent coupon. Well, convertibles are a little bit different. You actually do get the right to convert your your debt and and forgive you convert it into stock. And so, typically, that conversion price is higher 
than the stock price. So Groupon, I think their conversion price is at $5. So this company lent money to Groupon, I think it was $250 million, and they said, okay, you have to pay us interest, it's debt, so you of course have to pay us interest, and you have to pay us back the $250 million because you borrowed it from us, plus interest. But, but we also have the right, at our election, we have the right to convert our debt into stock at $5 or so. So if the stock goes to 100, of course they would prefer to convert their debt into into stock and that way they can sell their stock and they can realize that successful, you know, 20-fold growth in in their instrument. Convertible bonds do have lower uh, coupons than uh, than traditional bonds. So let's say Groupon, the reverse happens. Let's say the company does very poorly and and it goes into the toilet. Well, you feel much better owning the debt because at least you're going to get your principal back, most likely, and your um, and your interest. Uh, it's less interest, but it's better than losing money. So it's a way to get equity upside without the downside. Now, of course, if the company really goes into the toilet, then um, your debt may not get paid back either, and, and that's also a risk. So in any event, that's kind of the the way convertible bonds work. And at some point, I'll... I'll uh, talk about um, d debt in more detail. But for now, let's let's head into Groupon because we're really starting to get a sense and a picture of the internet sector by having looked at uh, several of these companies, some very large companies, some middle-sized companies, some pretty small, small companies, and uh, I've enjoyed it very much. And Groupon is a fascinating situation. This company was, was founded in 2008 and they, they've experienced this amazing growth. I think what people forget is when a company is doing poorly, people forget where it came from. And this is a company that, um, and I'm, I'm generally positively disposed to it, so that's the spoiler alert. Um, there are, um, uh, this is a company that had a huge, huge, huge growth and then recently has fallen into some trouble. And the question is, well, can they turn themselves around uh, or are they going to continue to, I don't know, uh, stay in this state of affairs? Um, so we'll talk all about that. So basically, I, I, you know, you can build all these models and things like that, but one of the things that you got to do is try the service. So I actually tried the service myself, and I got this little Groupon. It's like a coupon, I guess. So um, basically, I found these 15 bottles of wine. I have all this expensive wine here, and I don't always want to drink it. So if I'm on a date... And the date doesn't know the difference between uh, heartwood and oak. Uh, Fifteen bottles for I think it was for thirty dollars. It was for thirty dollars. Let's see, sixty-five dollars. There we go. So this is five dollars, uh, less than five dollars for a bottle of wine. 